We have 34 kinetics and 39 energy weapons, making up a grand total of 74 non-power exotic weapons in Destiny 2. And I ranked them all in a not tier list, because on this channel, we don't really do normal tier lists. We tend to go by the broader categories of bad, okay, good, great, and elite, to sort out the Hawkmoons from the exotic glaives with a bit more nuance, care, and feeling. So it's still kind of a tier list, but with words. We sat down, made a spreadsheet, and tested everything on both console and PC, mixing inputs and environments, and using everything with the modest build that matches the weapon. We ranked this list according to 1. Their outright PvP performance, 2. Their exotic functionality, and 3. The accessibility of both of these things. For obvious reasons, we didn't touch power exotics since they operate on a different playing field. We made sure to not let the wider meta influence things too much, and when a build was boosting a weapon's performance, we judged it accordingly. So without further ado, let's begin. Welcome to the exotic not tier list of 2023, right before Lightfall. The bad weapons are the ones you want to avoid at all cost. These have very little redeeming qualities, are bugged, or are just plain bad when it comes to shooting the mans. So let's start with a surprising one that I wasn't expecting to put here at all, Arbalest. This gun got nerfed twice in 2022, with the one hitting in Season 18 being the final death knell. This gun's crazy aim assist and its casual disregard for flinch were the main draws, but now it has less aim assist and more flinch than pretty much every legendary sniper in the game. It's well and truly dead, and it will not be missed one bit. Cerberus plus one hasn't changed much since the last time we've done this, but it's been wholly left behind in this new age of sidearms and SMGs dominating the close range meta. It's a fine weapon, but it's not worth the exotic slot unless your name is Travel Danielle. If you don't hear from me after this video is uploaded, you know why. Did you know that Dead Messenger hits for 85? Yeah, I'm not joking. 85 damage, 85 whole damage hit points from a shot. So I don't think this one needs an explanation. All the exoticness in the world can't detract from the fact that it does 85 damage on a hit. It's definitely bad now. Destiny's no stranger to unique exotics and Delicate Tomb is certainly unique in all the ways it wants to make you pull your teeth out. Its horizontal fire mode is useless in PvP, and its normal ADS mode works some of the time. It's a rapid fire fusion, and they're just not very good at the moment. Ionic traces are nice, but Cold Heart exists for that. Hard pass. The three class-specific exotic glaives are Edge of Action, Edge of Concurrence, and Edge of Intent. Moving on, if you like Ariana's Vow in PvP, you are one of two people. You're either a bow blinter holding on to your former glory, or you're a new light that is afraid of using a legendary sniper. There's no other reason to use it. This one's just a head scratcher. Graviton Lance Enjoyers will likely not care about anybody's thoughts on their favorite weapon, so I'm just gonna say that its exotic perk doesn't work very often in PvP. The two burst nature is difficult to get a hang of, and legendary scouts outperform it handily. But hey, on the sticks, at least it feels good. Unlike Hierarchy of Needs, which seems to be allergic to killing people, there's far too much setup for such mediocre performance. It's easy enough to charge the Guidance Ring on hits, but then actually getting kills through the auto-tracking ring is painful. The ring effectively immobilizes you, and all you end up doing is telegraphing your position to your opponents the whole time it's up. The damage just isn't good enough for PvP. You need to be a very good bow user to make the best out of it, and if you are a good bow user, literally every other bow is better than this. Not worth the hassle, despite feeling very exotic. Now, I know many people are going to celebrate this, but all I could think of when I was testing Lord of Walls was, what the f*** happened to this weapon? Shots were flat out not registering, and the weapon either had no range or slug range. There was no discernible difference in performance in either normal or release the wolves mode at all. There was no consistency in using this, and I think Lord of Wolves got hit with one nerf far too many. It's practically unusable, something that many will be happy to hear after its long, unabated reign of terror in the Crucible. Skyburner's Earth is a meme gun. You know it. I know it. Even your dog knows it. It's fine. It can scorch targets now, which means it's a contender to use with a knife build for hunters. But why? Speaking of why, the only reason you'd use the fourth horseman is to deal with bubbles, or to signal that there may be something very wrong with you and you actually like it this way. Seek help. Or God. Ideally both. 
And finally, Touch of Malice, a gun that is not only a rapid-fire scout rifle, but kills you when you use it in the only form that's usable, the final round state. It demands an Emperift or Loyally build to use it with any hope of getting a result, and whilst the final round TTK is actually fairly competitive, you're kind of chancing your luck by killing yourself whilst you're trying to kill somebody else. You better hope that they can't hit any shots. So for that reason, it's just not a very good weapon overall for PvP. The okay weapons are those that kind of just do a job. They're not fantastic, but they're not crap either. Average players will find that these work quite well most of the time. Good players will like them to switch up the monotony. But are they worth your exotic slot? Let's start with Bastion. Oh boy, if you're old like me, you remember when this thing used to be a menace. Now, after a cone angle adjustment and a hefty damage nerf, the fusion is best suited for up close and personal engagements, most of which involve a barricade. Does a job though, and definitely feels unique, but it's not an automatic win condition anymore. The greatest thing that Izanagi's Burden had going for it was scavenger mods in PvP, but that's no longer a thing anymore, meaning that in order to get the Honed Edge X4 shot, you need to pick up two bricks. That's two kills with your primary before you can start to use the gun for what it was meant to be used for. After which, it's a devastatingly free body shot kill. That's not a bad price, but in reality, you end up working quite hard for that. Outside of its exotic functionality, it's an okay sniper, nothing special. Jade Rabbit had a bit of fun in Season Plunder, didn't it? It was suddenly and unexpectedly meta after scouts got buffed a little bit too much, but just like all the other scouts, it's been pulled back and its aim assist has been toned down to acceptable levels, to the point where it just feels like a normal scout rifle. It feels great in the hands, but Fate of All Fools is the Wish.com head seeker, making this feel like one of the guns of all time. Arbalest and Lorentz Driver are usually two sides of the same coin in PvP, but this time around I still feel confident enough to use Lorentz. Maybe it's placebo, maybe it's familiarity having used this weapon for so long, but but Lorenz still feels fairly consistent if your aim is roughly on target. I don't feel like I need to work as hard as I do for Arbalest to get the kill. And in the off chance you get three kill confirmed tags for the Lagrangian sight buff, it's devastating. But that's very rare to pull off and in testing I actually never got it to proc. It still looks, sounds and feels every bit as exotic as before. Monte Carlo and Paper should be a baller exotic. Markov Chain functions like Swashbuckler, but with a chance to refill your melee, making this a powered melee builder's dream weapon. However, it only has 15 zoom instead of the typical 16 zoom of this archetype, and that's enough to notice that this gun just feels noticeably worse than other 600 autos in terms of recoil, stability, and general stickiness. You have to engage closer as well, which puts you in SMG territory. Hard to master, but on the whole, very, very easy to like. Kind of like Prometheus Lens, but this thing actually doesn't seem to have an exotic perk that makes any difference in PvP. Its third column perk is Budget Subsistence, which doesn't make sense in PvP seeing as you don't usually have reserves to pull from, and its main perk seems to imply that you can scorch targets, which is fine, but you're going to want to be going for the pure kill anyways instead of an ignition combo. Weird weapon, exotic wise, otherwise it feels like a marginally better trace rifle. Risk Runner is an okay 900 RPM SMG, with its 13 zoom really making life difficult. But when Superconductor and Arc Conductor get going, you won't really care. Dueling a Risk Runner is always risky if you have Arc anything equipped, and you can even consume a Pulse Nade to proc Arc Conductor on yourself if you think there's an opportunity to chain multiple enemies. But on its own, it's just very blah and you're not usually in control when the gun goes from a 3 out of 10 to an 8 out of 10. Funny Orb Go Brrrr is the name of the game with Ruinous Effigy, and despite having limited ammo, it actually feels pretty good to use once you're in the right ranges. The right ranges, however, are firmly in SMG territory, which makes using this a deliberate and conscious choice. But when you do turn your man into a ball, not only is it the funniest shit you've ever seen, but it's also very lethal. A huge advantage is that you're in mobile third person mode, so you can really time those space jam moments. Tight blast radius, but huge amounts of fun, if you can get going. Sweet Business is a weapon that does this. Need I say more? It's fine. 
huge meme potential, but unlikely to help you go flawless anytime soon. Tiku's Divination is one of those if you know, you know type bows. It's actually quite fun to lane with, setting up in the back and watching the tracked arrows do their thing. Explosions require you to prime someone in hipfire before hitting them again, but savvy players know how to counter this by simply not re-peaking. In reality, Tiku's is a hard bow to extract performance out of unless you're very aggressive, and even then, you'd be using a hipfire bow. Which, you know. Thanks to some new silicon, Tommy's matchbook is fairly competitive in this ever-changing landscape. However, the thermal limitations of the MacBook are still hindering its performance. Unlike Touch of Malice, the concentrated burn won't kill you, but it will certainly make your MacBook Pro 16 a little uncomfortable to the touch for prolonged periods. In dueling situations, you're trading damage for health, and it takes a great player to know how to use that effectively. At least it's got perfect performance from the hip, but the form factor might be too big to fit into your pocket. And finally, we have Wave Splitter, which suffers from the Prometheus lens problem of not having a viable perk that procs often in PvP. Supercharged battery requires you to A. Pick up an orb, and B. Reload. Two things that decidedly don't happen in PvP when you use this weapon. Outside of that, it's a good trace and worth taking for a spin. There's going to be some people who might contest my take on exotic conditions of certain weapons, but I have to emphasize the accessibility of the exotic functionality. If you need to do X to get to Y to get to Z, that's a bit difficult for most to wrap their head around, especially in PvP. And why would they bother when other exotics offer superior immediacy with their exoticness? That's what you're going to find a lot of in the next section. Exotic functionality ready to go. The good weapons are our baseline, a sort of median point in terms of capability, functionality, and accessibility. Every single one of these is perfectly capable of doing what they do, and a great player can really make it their own and base their PvP identity around them, as long as you remember that there are far more capable exotics out there. Let's start with Bad Juju, which I unironically said was one of the best pulse rifles in the game. Well, time has passed and I still think it's an excellent weapon, for 6v6 only. String of Curses is wonderfully useful and capable, giving you bonus super energy and a damage boost that stacks up to 5 times on kills, but its damage profile means that you're going to struggle in the top end of PvP with it, much like all rapid fire pulses. Great feeling gun, incredibly exotic to boot, performance is just sort of alright. Borealis's only claim to fame is being a statistical anomaly. Typically, aggressive frame snipers trade high damage for low handling and stability, but Borealis throws that away by not only having great stats out of the box, but also being able to amplify either reload speed, stability, or handling by selecting solar, void, or arc elements respectively. Statistically speaking, in arc mode it's probably the best sniper in the game, but stats being maxed out doesn't make this feel very exotic on its own, and its exotic perk Ionic Return has almost zero uptime with no way to reliably prepare for it. So it's just a very good sniper, but you can't really justify taking up an exotic slot. Unlike Coldheart, which now spawns Ionic Traces to juice up your arc 3.0 builds, Coldheart's damage ramps up to lethal levels very quickly, and it feels generally very good on both MK and controller. However, its ammo economy is downright terrible, and the traces don't always spawn. It's a bit of a mixed bag when you're using this weapon, but it does work very well when it's on song. Speaking of weapons that work when they're on song, there are few more satisfying weapon gameplay loops than Collective Obligation. Suppress, weaken, or make someone volatile, shoot them when they're in that state, hold the long reload button, and you gain a very handy damage buff that lasts for 10 seconds. It's fantastically addictive when you get in that groove, but that's a tall order for anyone who isn't super comfortable with either adaptive pulses or void through binary abilities. There's a steep learning curve to this weapon, and that's why I can only really put it in good. Otherwise, this is a fantastic gun. Dead Man's Tail has been through quite the journey this year, but it's now settled into its final form. A fairly capable hipfire scout that can kind of do the ADS thing too, but it's nowhere near as scary as it once was, and now it's just a fairly unique and versatile scout, which is nothing to shrug at. You have to be more precise to make it work thanks to its numerous aim assist nerfs, and you have to make use of cover a lot, like a 120 RPM hand cannon. 
It still does the job when called upon, and that warrants an inclusion at this level. It's just hard to place it higher knowing full well what it once used to be. Hardlight got the fundamentals treatment, and it's really quite something to use these days. You can max out your stability, or nearly max out your handling, it's 100 aim assist feels incredible, and you have your ever-present ricochet rounds which have a learning curve but are very usable on the right maps. But it's still just a 600 auto, and there's nothing outside of boosting base behavior that makes this more than what it is out of the box. Yotun is here. Yotun exists. Can't aim? No worries. Yotun will take care of it for you. Yotun will ease your burdens and enrich your assets. Yotun will soothe your pain and draw you a warm bath, filled with only the highest quality fire. Yotun will help you learn that you should call it tax avoidance and not tax evasion. Yotun is love. Yotun is life. It's pretty good. Malfeasance is really, really good for those pesky enemies that refuse to stay out in the open long enough for you to kill them. So like every good PvP player. Put five body shots in and watch them get deleted from this dimension. Explosive Shadow, the exotic intrinsic perk, is powerful enough to handle rifts and wells, but it's not powerful or agile enough to deal with a roaming super. It's a good exotic perk, but it requires you to be suboptimal to make the best out of it. Outside of that, it's a very stable 180 RPM hand cannon that duels rather well, I have to say. Interesting weapon. Merciless is the biggest surprise for me on this list. It was buffed over the course of 2022 and it's actually incredibly good now. You will almost certainly need the catalyst because the stat bumps it gets transforms this weapon from a has-been to a must-have. This is one of the most consistent special weapons in the game, but its exotic functionality, conserve momentum, is going to have next to zero uptime on anything other than close range maps with a bit of ammo in reserve. It's a PvE gun through and through, but it doubles as a devastatingly effective PvP sleeper. Oh man, Mida Multi-Tool, what happened to you, mate? Once an underrated movement option for larger maps to put in great damage, but balance passes since the last time we did this means that this is a weapon that requires you to stay back and pray to God that nobody returns fire because you will get flinched off badly. It's not a good dueling weapon anymore, but its synergy with the Callus Mini Tool cannot be ignored. It's had a bad fall from grace, but you get so many passive benefits just from running this that it deserves to be in the good category. Just don't expect any miracles. I once said that Outbreak Perfected was the best training wheels gun for people looking to get good in the Crucible. Now, the number of people who want to get good is getting smaller every day with every passing bad comp rework, but this weapon has stood the test of time as a consistently excellent all-rounder. Zero recoil on both M&K and controller, a good amount of stickiness in the mid-range, and nanites on a precision kill are more than useful. It's just not going to blow your socks off when you use it. Quicksilver Storm hasn't really made any waves since its debut in Season of Plunder, and there's a reason for that. It's a 720 auto with a grenade launcher mode that fires projectiles that do 121 damage, as well as tracking rockets that occasionally come out when firing on a target. The performance of each of these aspects don't really set anyone's hairs on fire, but it's a super stable package, has very good range for its frame, and it just feels good to use. Its party trick is that the grenades can delete barricades and damage the titan behind them. Not bad. Sunshot is the last 150 RPM hand cannon in the game, and it is incredibly satisfying to use when it works. It can 3-tap slightly quicker than all 140s, and it's a nightmare to duel against with its explosive rounds just doing explosive round things dialed to 11. Enemies going kaboom is also a lovely bonus. However, it has very limited range and requires you to play quite aggressively to get the best out of it. Its base stats are rather poor aside from airborne effectiveness, which helps with the aggression. This is a hard weapon to master for the average player, or at least harder than using most 140s. One of my favorite exotics from Destiny 1, and still going strong in Destiny 2, is Suros Regime. I really love that what you see is practically what you get with this weapon. You can either spin up, pre-fire corners and delete unsuspecting customers, or you can be an absolute nuisance at range with dual speed receiver. The health regen that occasionally procs is a nice bonus too, but again there's not a whole lot that's making this weapon feel exotic other than the fact that it's basically two guns in one, and moderately lethal at being both. Although I have to say, the focus fire mode, turning into a 360 with the stats of a 600, definitely wins a lot of brownie points with me. Symmetry would be an unstoppable weapon if it wasn't a rapid fire scout rifle. 
but it is. And the way you activate the exotic perk is by landing precision hits, not kills, thank god. Because when you get 7 hits and activate the revolution arc seeker rounds, it turns into a very scary 3 tap machine. If you manage to build up to X13, you're 2 tapping. This is a serious weapon, but it does take a while to get going and the base performance is just sort of okay. Fun weapon to use overall, and a very strong contender for the downright sexiest exotic in the game. Telesto exists. It does things. It's fun to do things with them. It's very unremarkable, but it can do area denial things quite well. And you can't shoot the bolts anymore to detonate them. Other than that, it can do things to create some of the plays of all time. It pains me to see it reduced to this level, but the chaperone is no longer the outright menace it used to be, thanks to the global shotgun nerfs that happened this year. Its base range is just normal slug range, which is still fairly okay, but the Roadborne perk boosts it to 12 meters, which is still not super high. It was probably for the best, given how silly it got, especially in an Emperift using Lunar Faction's boots, but it's still a great weapon in the right hands. That being said, for the average player, when you use it, you may wonder what the fuss is all about with this thing, and you'd be right. Much like the Manticore, whose exotic perk and playstyle loop seems to be a direct counter to airborne effectiveness, but most of the time being suspended in the air isn't really all that helpful, surprisingly. It's good for getting a few extra inches of distance between you and an oncoming shotgun ape, but that's it. Every other time I've seen it being used or used it myself, it just made me a sitting duck and I wanted to get off the anti-grav train. Which is a shame, because it's a fantastic feeling 900 RPM SMG that performs really rather well. Bloody hell Thorn, I hope the days ahead of you are better than the ones we have now. A former terror of the Crucible that got converted to a 140 RPM hand cannon, but kept the stat profile of a 150. The range of Thorn these days is absolutely pitiful, and if you can manage to pick up a Soul Devourer orb, you're able to potentially secure two taps. But its range means that you're going to be playing extremely aggressively, and unless you're a great player, you're just kind of asking for hurt. Devastating when it gets going, but getting going is the task. The placement of this weapon is entirely down to the madness of one of my testers, Haythra, who has managed to convince me that Trinity Ghoul is a very capable bow once you learn how to do basic bow things like positioning and not running into enemies headfirst. No mad? Because once you get that kill, the chain lightning bow is ready as soon as you knock it. And from there, it's self-explanatory. The chain has a good amount of range and damage, and it's really as simple as pick up and play. The hard part is just getting good with bows first, but when you do, this is one of the best options in the game. The same can be said for Wish Ender, which gives you wall hacks as soon as you fully draw it. That alone makes this one of the most insane exotics to use in PvP. In sixes, it can definitely feel like information overload, but in threes, this is a literal cheat code. The only reason it's not higher is because you're likely not going to be doing all that much killing with the bow itself, relying on another primary to blint with. It does 129 to the head, the same as a lightweight bow, but it has a longer draw time than most precisions. So the wall hacks come at a high price. But if you can make it work, then this is a very strong contender. And that's all of the good weapons. Some of them are definitely better than some of their peers in this category, but it's important to establish this level as the baseline, because the next category is where the fun begins. And once you see what's there, you'll start to understand the decisions for the previous category a little bit more. Great weapons are the ones that are on the cusp of being meta contenders, but they need an elite player to take them there. Every single one of these can be severely disruptive in the Crucible in the right hands, whilst for the average Joe, they're a noticeable step up from everything we've seen up until this point. So let's start with Aga's Scepter, which, like its other Trace Rifle siblings, has a massive ammo problem. But it is incredible to use when you have some. It feels so stable on both inputs, and the slow burst on a kill can sometimes catch another player, granting you an easy double kill. It also has an illegal amount of range as well, but its main party trick is its catalyst, Will Given Form, which converts your full super energy into a super beam that completely destroys your opponents. It only lasts until the super energy or ammo runs out, but if you pick up enough green, you could easily get three free kills with this, especially with its third column perk refilling your mag from reserves. Scary weapon when the conditions are right. 
The most exotic sniper in the game is also the best exotic sniper in the game. Of course, it's Cloud Strike. It's hard not to love this weapon. Shoot someone in the head and Thor himself rains down lightning at your enemy's location, dealing fatal splash damage to any poor sod that happened to be standing nearby. It's so terrifying that it's an automatic callout when you see it in trials or competitive, and in sixes, it can destroy entire teams with only one bullet. The only reason it's not elite is because it's a rapid fire sniper, meaning you're tickling your enemies if you only hit the body. You better hit the head or else. In a way, it's a great sniper to learn sniping with because when you get it right, few things in this game have as satisfying a feeling. Next up, Devil's Ruin is just flat out incredible when you learn to work around this gun's biggest downside. As an adaptive sidearm, it has one of the quickest primary TTKs at 0.6 seconds with four headshots required, but its alt fire mode, a laser beam that takes one second to charge up, can delete just about anything that has the misfortune of crossing its path. The biggest issue is that one second, which is a very long time in Destiny 2. It requires a good amount of game sense to make the best use out of it, but once you get used to it, it's insanely devastating. Previously elite, but a victim of changing metas, duality is now my number one pick for shotguns in this game. ADS for slug mode, hipfire for pellet mode. Get a kill in hipfire and you get a buffed slug shot, which is so important now that shotguns practically have no range anymore. It's so intuitive to use and so deadly effective that it could arguably still be elite, but quite honestly the playstyle has a learning curve now. Getting up close and personal just isn't that easy in a world of sidearms and SMGs. The weapon itself though is still fantastic. If you have the playstyle down, it'll never leave your inventory. You know the phrase technically correct is the best kind of correct? Well, that's how I would describe Fighting Lion and its small army of followers who are, as of the making of this video, incredibly drunk with happiness. This weapon has been reworked since the last time we made this video, and it's genuinely a menace. An infant ammo grenade launcher is always incredibly annoying to deal with, but its super high handling means that if you like blinting enemies, this is your weapon. Don't let the zero reload speed fool you, dealing any sort of damage will boost it significantly, especially if you start chaining it against barricades or multiple enemies. It's not totally lethal on its own, but it is going to make more than a few people switch to it in one game. And that's the mark of a great weapon, even if it's for morally questionable reasons. I was not expecting the Huckleberry to be as good as it is, but it is that and more. SMGs got a tuning pass to their zoom in 2022, and that pass brought the Huckleberry up to par with some of its brethren, gaining two extra zoom points. For those of you who know, two zoom points is an absolutely bonkers buff to make, and it shows. This gun is absolutely ridiculous in the hands now on both inputs, and you never have to reload it either. It's meant to be chained with Rampage and Ride the Ball, which makes this a monster for 6v6 game modes. In threes, it's still quite strong having the 750 RPM damage profile, but it never really gets going like it does in sixes. It's still a genuine menace, I highly recommend you go give this thing a spin. Lumina had some stat boosts at the start of 2022 which greatly improved this weapon, but there still wasn't much reason to run it over its siblings. That being said, it's a fantastic weapon with competitive stats and a killer exotic perk, healing rounds on a kill. You can instantly heal teammates and give the both of you a 10 second damage buff in the process. It isn't enough to make your high impact snipers one shot, but it can certainly boost other special weapons to be more consistent. An underrated weapon for the more compassionate players out there. My god is Osteostriga bloody annoying. This gun came out with the Witch Queen and made waves as the first craftable exotic, and with tracking rounds to boot. It belongs to the 600 RPM SMG family, which has certainly seen better days in the meta, but the fact is that any weapon that can be hip fired and used from behind cover to hit your enemies is a weapon of high consideration. The tracking rounds also make a mockery of airborne effectiveness too, and the reason it's great is because of the travel time. Unironically, the amount of people you will catch out thinking they're safe from the fight, or even just killing them after you go down is remarkably high. It's not going to make waves and threes anytime soon, but it's a very accessible exotic right off the bat. Make sure to grab the catalyst because those stat bumps to stability and reload are no joke. Polaris Lance is the giga chad of all scout rifles. It's an energy scout, it's solar, it's beautiful, and it feels beautiful to use in the hands. Now that PvP is exclusively long range maps, it seems, Polaris has found a home in my inventory more often than not because of its stat package. The perfect fifth round is incredibly satisfying when you get it too. In terms of exoticness, it's fairly unremarkable, but the whole package more than makes up for it. Top bins this.
In the age of invisibility, racking has been surprisingly overlooked by a lot of players. Perhaps its reputation of being a meme fireteam weapon has preceded it, but it's a very capable sidearm on its own. Reloading after a kill, which you will get, grants you invisibility, whose duration is easily boosted by the Echo of Persistence fragment. You can practically spend a good chunk of any game invisible, but it does require a hefty amount of game sense to do so given that your radar is completely muted. In an average player's hands, this is a great weapon, but in the hands of someone who knows, you're never going to see them coming. And if you have two or three Rat Kings together, well, Stern, meet a distance meta tailored to your needs. Oh, and here's Drang, now fully reworked and craftable to be one of the best PvP sidearms in the game. 120 RPM stat monster, its sidearm Drang will quickly rack up the kills and then you've got a two tap on command with Sturm for one body and one head. This is a combo package. To get the best out of Sturm, you must use a Drang. But on its own, it's plenty good as well. The combo will require a learning curve if you're not used to it, but it will be worth the journey. The last word, mercifully, is no longer completely sentient, but it does have traces of what the f just happened juice in reserve. It's still an absolute monster on controller, but after a patch in May 2022, it's now plenty usable on mouse and keyboard as well. It's been reined in quite a bit, so it's no longer a mid-range menace, but up close and personal, you're not going to find a whole lot out there that's better than this. When I reviewed Trespasser, I said its main downside was that tunnel vision couldn't be refreshed on a kill, and that meant it didn't synergize properly with its exotic functionality, the unrepentant super burst. That's now been fixed, and it's still a fantastic feeling sidearm with great damage and a decent amount of range. It's for the aggressive, by the aggressive, and with the right player, it'll take a lobby by storm. The super burst won't one bang a guardian all the time due to high resilience being meta, but it's enough to severely compromise them. And finally, Wither Horde. Yes, it's here for one reason and one reason only. It f**ks people's days up. Whether it's used tactically for area denial, offensively for destroying bubble titans, or just plain fun as a skill shot to try and direct impact people, Wither Horde is a real pick up and play, top shelf option that will destroy quite literally everything in the Crucible. It takes a smart player to use it correctly, but even if you're unfamiliar with it, just use it and watch how people respond to one of your pools of death. The ability to make your enemy think twice and subsequently use that confusion to turn a game on its head is the power of Wither Horde which means it's up there with the very best exotics in the game. Great exotics in the hands of a great player are some of the scariest to deal with in the game. Not much beats a smart player with a good weapon, but the following exotics don't need a good player to be terrifying. In the wrong hands, they're worthy of respect and caution. And in the right hands, you're gonna wish that you played something else. This final section are the guns that speak for themselves and speak with authority. They command your respect like David Attenborough and make their presence known as soon as they fire their first bullet. Most will see a noticeable increase in their own performance if they use these weapons, and the few who persist with one and make it their own become very problematic to deal with. These are the very best weapons in the game, bar none. Their status is not a matter of opinion. Well. At least in my opinion. Everyone's got a favourite type of coffee. A comfort meal. An ideal way to brew a cup of tea. That's what Ace of Spades is in Destiny 2 Old Reliable. It hasn't changed one bit since the last time we did this. It's accurate, it hits like a truck, the momentum mori rounds are incredible, and the permanent radar is so so underrated. If you're having a bad day, Ace of Spades will pick you up and remind you what home is. It's not spectacular, but home comforts never are. A brilliant weapon for all occasions. If Ace of Spades is your cream of mushroom soup, then Crimson is a Pakistani chicken karai with extra chilies. This weapon will hit them for six. It'll hit you for six. It'll f***ing hit everyone for six. This is a full-blooded, no prisoners taken pulse rifle in a hand cannon's body that will dominate everyone and everything that has the misfortune of crossing its crosshairs. It's got a reputation as a controller weapon, but it's equally as deadly on mouse and keyboard too. Incredible range, great damage, reload on kill and health regen? You're an idiot for not using it. Returning to the halls of the elite is divinity. Yes. No, I don't need help. You will need it more. Why? Because of the bubble, my friend. The f***ing bubble. The bubble allows Divinity to hit around corners, as well as convert any bullets from your teammates into instant crit shots. If you have a bubble around you, you better hope the enemy team is distracted. 
Of course, there are limitations. Divinity is not immune from the ammo problems of trace rifles, and sure, it has a one second time to kill. But this gun is ridiculously effective 100% of the time. Get that bubble up by being on target for half a second and the rest is automatic. It is brilliant. A year ago, John Halo popped around to Destiny 2 and he left us a present for the 30th anniversary patch, and that was Forerunner. This weapon was already pretty strong before the sidearm buff, then it became absolutely ridiculous, now it's slightly less ridiculous, but it's literally a pocket scout rifle that can be hip fired. It feels like the Halo Magnum and can hit its targets from about the same distance away too. The rock is a bit of a meme, but the gun itself is so unique, so sticky and so versatile that it deserves to be amongst the best in the game. Fantastic weapon. Hawkmoon returns to the elite band of weapons for being a precision-based statistical anomaly of a weapon with an absolute banger of an exotic perk in paracausal rounds. On its own, it feels better than a lot of hand cannons out there, and it's absolute magic on controller for being a precision-based weapon that you would think would be more naturally suited to M&K. Its random rolls help elevate an already solid experience, I personally prefer Rangefinder and Killing Wind, and then the power calls or rounds come in. With 9 in the mag and 6 being the magic number to get a one-shot kill, it can be intimidating to learn how to be patient. But learn you will, and the rewards you will reap if you put in the time to really master this weapon. Every Hawkmoon user I've ever faced has 5 digit kill trackers, and it's little wonder why. I'm convinced that if you're a Limonarch main, you are legitimately one bad day away from committing murder. If you're new here, the Monarch is a precision frame bow with a nasty bite. If drawn and released perfectly, you release a poison arrow that deals damage over time, effectively neutralizing opponents and finishing off anyone even moderately tickled by any other enemy fire. It's a gold medal farmer's dream and a legitimately horrible weapon to face in trials. I don't think I need to go on here. Yuck. With the rise of abilities in 2022, the mid-range meta gave way to slightly longer range options, and it was here that people finally saw just how busted No Time To Explain actually was. Great range, incredible damage with a 0.67 neutral time to kill, and a little sentient black hole buddy that shot hitscan bullets to help you win every duel you ever took on. The only condition being that you needed to get 10 crits. As Void Titans became more popular, this gun helped break many deadlocks by doing a little more than one gun's worth of damage. That, and it's just an excellent weapon all round that's easy to pick up and even easier to master. This thing is a plague, and the recent nerfs haven't slowed it down one bit. Revision Zero arrived onto the scene with much fanfare as it was the brainchild of former community member now turned mad weapons bastard at Bungie, Mercules. This aggressive pulse rifle can shoot in its normal 4 bullet mode to 2 burst people optimally, or it can be used as a very versatile 2 burst, making it a very hand cannon like pulse rifle in nature. Like No Time, the exotic perk is charged through precision hits, but unlike No Time, you get a f***ing aggressive frame sniper bullet in return for your precision. The threshold is higher, requiring 12 crits for one bullet, but that is some serious power for any exotic to keep in its back pocket. What's more, it's subject to aggressive pulse rifle stats and tuning, meaning this sniper bullet has a hard time being flinched and the hip fire cones are very, very tight in comparison. And it's fully craftable to boot. The one knock against this weapon is that the sniper bullet takes a while to charge, but for the power it gives you, I think it's a fair trade-off. Elite. The best SMG in the game by some distance is Taraba, because on top of being a very little SMG with a good stack package, you charge the exotic pack, Ravenous Beast, by simply existing. Either do damage or take damage without dying to charge up the recluse-like mode, hold reload when the gun is glowing, and proceed to terrorize the lobby for 7 glorious seconds. If an enemy has this on in comp or trials, take care of them quickly because the longer the round goes on, the less likely you are to come out on top. This weapon is bonkers, and the only learning curve is how not to die, which is easy enough if you know the two second rule. Traveler's Chosen, the weapon of choice for everyone who watches True Vanguard. In all seriousness though, it's a baller weapon. Final Blows grant you stacks of Gathering Light, up to 10, and each stack of Gathering Light boosts your reload, handling, and aim assist. Hold reload to consume the stacks and gain your ability energy back, how much you gain is based on your stacks. So in short, each kill makes this weapon stronger, and it actively helps your uptime on your builds if you kill a lot with it. It also shifts with 35 airborne effectiveness out of the box, making this a versatile short range slayer. And the Catalyst gives surplus, stat bonuses based on ability energy. Yeah. 
It's the perfect synergy in and of itself, and it's incredible to use. Coming back to the halls of the Elite, we have Vex Mythoclast, which is still a magnificent auto-fusion rifle. It has the damage profile of a high-impact auto, but with a slightly faster fire rate, and its damage ramps up with each kill. Get three kills to get your linear fusion rifle shot, which did not get touched by the last round of linear fusion nerfs, so when you use it, it's practically cheating. I don't think I need to add anything here. Vex is a dueling monster and has a deceptively high amount of range. Once you get one kill, it's very hard to deal with in the right hands, and it's definitely elite. My team and I had a bit of a debate over this one, but Vigilance Wing deserves to stay in Elite for one fact alone. It's the most forgiving pulse rifle in the entire game, requiring 7 crits and 2 body shots from its 2 bursts of 5 bullets to get the kill. And it's not half bad at getting those kills either, with a great sight no matter which ornament you choose, and a pension for just working well at all ranges. Those 5 bullets stack the damage up really quickly. The Ensemble Catalyst is also very welcome in this weapon, boosting handling and reload speed significantly around allies. In terms of exoticness, this is by far the least exotic one here in this list, even if its 5 burst pull is definitely unique. But it is so immediate and so easy to use that I can't help but put this in the top category. It's a fantastic weapon. But there's one weapon that surprised me more than any of the other ones this year. A weapon that was largely written off as a gimmick when it launched, but it is now firmly amongst the best. It's Cryosthesia 77k. Precision frame sidearms aren't the most popular things for good reason. They're the slowest killers of all the sidearms. But they're the most forgiving and have the most range requiring 3 crits and 1 body. The Cryo's party trick is the fact that you can turn 1 kill immediately into 2 because when you kill someone, you get a long fire, instant freeze shot that will stop even supers in their tracks, waiting to be shattered. You can do that with a simple melee or a special weapon. From my brief time with it, I found the most success with the sniper since if I'm close range, I'm close enough to melee or use to charge melee to shatter. The loop is simple, the weapon is forgiving, and it's devastating against every opponent you can think of. It works in both threes and sixes, and the hardest part is just getting that kill, which isn't even that hard once you understand the ranges. And once you do, you're off to the races. And that's it. Every exotic weapon ranked. I hope I got everything largely okay. I want to shout out my entire team for this one. This video was a massive project, taking just over three weeks to test, grab clips, write, and edit. It was no easy task, and I want to thank you for watching to the end. You are the reason we still do these. Until next time, my name is Ascendant Nomad, and I'm your Crucible Doctor. I'll see you soon. Cheers.